I wrote this tract in a way that um, I give the gospel. So, you know, if you want to know how, how I give the plan of salvation, you can pretty much just read through this. Uh, you know, if you're not very good at giving the plan of salvation or you don't think you're very confident at it, I mean, this could really help you. You can see the verses that you need to memorize. You can read through it and get familiar with, what, you know, what I'm trying to explain along the way. I'm not just going to, I'm not going to go through everything because I don't want to bore you guys with that. Because I know most of you guys here, you know, are very, very familiar at how to give the gospel. But I just want to note a couple of things along the way that I try to emphasize uh, when I'm giving the gospel. Now, I have, I've split it up into five points. So we have all sinned by breaking God's laws. God must punish sin. Jesus Christ took your punishment for you. What you must do to be saved from hell. And number five, receive the free gift of eternal life. So if anyone thinks, if anyone says, oh, you're one, two, three, repeat after me, just tell them, no, we're one, two, three, four, five, repeat after me. Uh, we have five points. But uh, and obviously we're not, we're not one, two, three, repeat after me either. But uh, we got, we got, I, I split it into five points here. So the first point, we have all sinned by breaking God's laws. When I, when I explain the gospel to people, there's a couple of things that I want them to get at this point. Number one is, you know, obviously that we've all sinned by breaking God's laws. But I want to make sure that they understand what the word sin is. And especially when you're talking to somebody that's foreign or, or somebody from China. You know, we, we take for granted that everybody knows what the word sin means. Whereas it's not always the case. I mean, obviously, if you're speaking to somebody from a Christian background, you may not need to go into it. But if you're speaking to somebody that English is not their first language, you know, make sure you clarify what the word sin means and, and explain that to them. You know, I don't spend a lot of time on the first point. You know, I believe Way of the Master and Ray Comfort and, and their, uh, uh, their ministry of how they teach people to give the gospel. I don't necessarily have anything against, you know, having the law before grace. Obviously, they preach a false gospel. They preach that you have to turn from your sins to be saved. But I think where they err uh, in, in how they uh, have the plan of salvation is they emphasize point number one way too much. And they think the power of salvation is in how sinful a person is. And they go through, are you a liar, you're a thieving, adulterer at heart? And they really are trying to bring this person under conviction and they think that's where the power of the gospel is. Meaning, if you can just show somebody how vile and how wretched and how sinful they are, then they will call out to the Savior and they'll want salvation. But, you know, we know in Romans 1.6, and uh, let's just uh, see that verse there. Romans 1.16, the Bible says, For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believeth, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. So the power of salvation is not in how sinful you are. The power of salvation is in the gospel of Christ. Gospel means good news. It's, it's the good news of the death, burial and resurrection that he's died and he's paid for our sins, that you have a free home in heaven to anyone that will believe on him. That's the power of the gospel and that's the point I want to emphasize to the person. I don't want to go away from their door just them thinking that I'm just some obnoxious person that just wanted to show them how wicked and how vile they were. You know, I want to just, them to just acknowledge, hey, you know, they are a sinner. They have sinned. And it doesn't take too long to actually show that to somebody. Some people do think that they haven't sinned. But I don't spend a lot of time on that. I just want them to acknowledge, hey, you have sinned. And the other thing I want to point out in that verse is if somebody thinks they have to be good enough to get to heaven, I use that first point to show them, well, that's why you can't be good enough to get to heaven, because you've already sinned. And the illustration that I use is generally a doctor that commits murder. So it doesn't matter how many lives you've saved, you could save a thousand lives, that doesn't get you off if you commit murder, just to show that one sin you know, will, will condemn you, even if you've done a lot of good. So it's the same that works with God. If you tell all this truth, that doesn't write off the fact that you've lied. And that's, that's the main points that I go through in point number one. You know, point number two, God must punish sin. Now, with point number two, for me, I, I don't make it a big point for them to, at this point, believe that hell is real. Because I don't want to get stuck on that, that rabbit or that point of, of trying to convince them that hell is a real place. Because most people that don't believe the Bible, they, 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 don't even, they haven't yet grasped the concept of hell, and they don't even know whether it's real yet. So at this point, you know, I don't want to 
get them stuck at point number two and not get to point number three, point number four, point number five, which I will get to if they have a problem with hell. But at that point, I just want them to acknowledge that God's punishment in the Bible is hell for sin. So they don't necessarily have to agree with it. They don't have to necessarily believe that it exists. But I'm just trying to show them that there is a punishment for sin and that God's punishment is hell, whether they believe it or not or whether they agree with it or not. That's what I'm trying to get across to them in point number two. Okay, point number three is where I explain the gospel. So instead of using Romans 5... I started using 1 Corinthians 15. Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures and that he was buried and that he rose again the third day according to the scriptures. I thought that was a great verse to turn to because it actually explains the gospel, the death, burial and resurrection. And you explain that in as much detail as you think is necessary for that person. That's what I do at point three. Okay, point number four, what you must do to be saved from hell. So this is what I would say to them. I'd say, you know, works are good but it's not necessary for salvation and you're explaining that it's only believed to be saved, that it's not works, not repent of your sins, not join a church, not keep the commandments. But the main thing that I emphasize here when I get to this point is the difference between knowing what Jesus did and believing on what Jesus did. And the way I explain it to them, I feel it really helps them to understand. Because when you first approach them and you ask them the question, do you know for sure you died today that you, that you would go to heaven? Most people are not sure. And most people are not sure because they're thinking they've done good, they're thinking they've done bad, they don't know how they measure up before God. That's 99% of the time what most people will think. So it's safe to assume that with most people. But you can ask them, you know, is that, is that what you think? So when I get to this point four and I say to them, you know, they said, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved in thy house. Sometimes what I'll say to people is, you know, when you read that verse, you're probably thinking, well, I already believe in Jesus. Especially if you're talking to somebody from a Christian background. They read that verse and they say, you know, I already believe in Jesus. But what they're saying, even though they say, I already believe in Jesus, what they're really saying is, I already know what Jesus has done. I already know who Jesus is. So what I want to do at that point, and what I found really effective is, is to point out that difference and, and I, what I will say to them, I'll say, you know what, when I first asked you, do you know for sure you died today, you go to heaven? You weren't sure. And it might be because you think you had to be good enough to go to heaven. Is that right? And they'll say, oh yeah, I was thinking, you know, am I good enough to go to heaven? And I say to them, you know, see, but you know what Jesus did. You know, I, I didn't teach you anything new here today. You know, you know about Jesus. You know what he did when he died on the cross. But then I relate it back to that doubt that they had. And I say to them, but the reason why you weren't sure is that even though you knew what Jesus did, you were trusting yourself to get you to heaven, weren't you? You were trusting your own goodness to take you to heaven. So do you see how that's not the belief that the Bible is talking about when it says believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. It's that you need to put all your faith in what Jesus has done for you to take you to heaven. So I find that that has been very effective when explaining the gospel to people, what it means to believe on people, especially those that are believing in work salvation, because it just brings it to the front of their mind saying, you said you believed, but you see how you weren't actually trusting? You were trusting your works. And what the Bible is saying when it says believe on the Lord Jesus Christ is you have to trust Jesus Christ to show them that difference. And I find that that has been very effective um, in getting people to understand what it means to believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. And then number five, you know, receive the free gift of eternal life. Um, this is the point where we would explain eternal security, explain that if they believe on Jesus Christ, that they would be saved forever. And that's a really good way of getting people to understand that it's only believe on Jesus Christ. And if they believe, they're saved forever. And that's how they can have assurance of salvation. And I usually give an example there. I, would, I, I give an example once I've explained everything to believe on Jesus, that you're saved forever. You know, you give the illustration of somebody that believes on Jesus and maybe doesn't go to church and maybe does something terrible like commit murder. Uh, and I think it's good to give that example so that it tests their understanding, to test whether or not they uh, understand eternal security, they, they understand that Jesus has paid it all. Now, if somebody has a problem understanding that concept, there's really two points that I sort of bring across to them. Number one is because the Bible says you have everlasting life, that the gift of God is eternal life. You know, I say to the number one, can God lie? If God says it's eternal life and it lasts forever, if it wasn't going to last forever, then God would be a liar. 
And number two, the point I try and explain to them to get them to understand that is, you know, well, when Jesus died on the cross, did he die for all sins? I asked them, did he die for all sins or did he just, just die for some sins? And everyone, most people will say, well, he died for all sins. He died for the sins of the world. And then I'll ask them, well, when Jesus died on the cross for all sins, did he die? He didn't just die for the sins in the past. He also died for sins in the future, didn't he? And they say, oh, yeah. Well, cause, so I asked them, because when he died on the cross, all our sins were in the future. He died 2,000 years ago. So all our sins were in the future. That's why we can have everlasting life, because when Jesus died on the cross, he's paid for all the sins in the future as well. It's all the sins that you don't even know you're going to commit. So even though a sin you may commit in the future may surprise you, it doesn't surprise God, because when he died on the cross, he knew every sin you were going to commit and every sin you have committed, you will commit in the future as well. So they're the, they're the main points that I say when I go through the plan of salvation. Hopefully there's a few tips there to help you. A couple of other tips, obviously, to, is to memorize the plan of salvation. If you can memorize the verses that you turn to, that'll just make you a lot more confident, a lot more comfortable when giving um, the plan of salvation. And, you know, this tract could help you. So if you just read through the tract and memorize the verses in there, that could help you. A couple of other practical tips out so many. Now, when you're giving the gospel to somebody or you're talking to somebody, if there, you know how sometimes there are distractions that come along? Maybe it's a dog. Maybe it's telephone, the telephone. Maybe it's uh, uh, their loved one calling them to come to dinner or come to lunch. Maybe it's like a, a brother or a sister that's walking past the front door and they're like, what are they doing, right? Now, my advice to you when those distractions occur is to always acknowledge the distraction. Don't just ignore the distraction. So let's say somebody is like, list, list, uh, you know, supposedly listening to me give the gospel and they, you know, it looks like they're looking at their phone and they need to send a text. I won't just keep going. I'll say, hey, you know, hey, fin you know, if you need to finish the text, you just finish it and then, and then when you finish, let me know and then we'll continue. And then they'll normally say, oh, no, no, and then they'll put their phone away. Or if somebody comes and they're, you know, they're walking by the front door and they're listening and they're seeing what's going on, I don't just ignore them. I'll say like, oh, hey, how are you doing? You know, I'm just explaining a couple of things to them. You're welcome to listen. Well, my point there is, 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 I find that if you acknowledge the distraction, if there's a distraction that comes into the conversation and you acknowledge it, then it gets their mind off it. You know, maybe the phone is ringing. You say, hey, do you need to get the phone? You know, you can, you can answer the phone and we can continue afterwards. I find that, that really helps. Otherwise, you know, they're distracted. They're not really listening to you and you're continuing to explain something. And because of that distraction, they're not talking to you. So whether it's the phone, relatives, babies and kids, you know, if something is really getting in the way, you know, point it out and say, you know, is, is, uh, is there something we can do to make it uh, easier for you to, to, to listen? Um, another point, another uh, a good soul winning tip I think is good. Now remember that when, you, when you're going soul winning and you're talking to people, now this is a conversation that you're having. You know, it's not, a, it's not a presentation that you have to go through. So even when you think of this plan of salvation, don't think that you have to hit every single one of these points in this order, right? Because if, if somebody is, uh, you know, going to an Anglican church or going to a Baptist church and they're not sure of their salvation, you may not need to spend much time on the first couple of points. So feel free to jump to where it's different and go back and clarify things. You know, that, like we were talking about at the beginning, you know, we don't have to have this one cookie cutter method just for everybody because we're talking to an individual. And we're not trying to get them to just sit through this sales presentation like, okay, you sit down and I'm just going to talk to you and, 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 and do this sales pitch because I want to customize it to that person. So, you know, get to the point. If there's an issue that they have, hey, let's address that issue. You know, if there's, there's a question they have, let's address that question. You know, you don't want to get carried away on rabbit trails. If they have a question, sometimes addressing it might be, hey, that's a good question, but um, let me just explain this to you first. But just remember, it's a conversation. You're talking to an individual that you want to interact with. It's not a sales presentation that they just have to go through. And the reason why I say that, because sometimes with people that are new to soul winning, somebody has an objection or somebody already understands something, but they just feel that they need to go through these points because they think, you know, because I'm soul winning and I need to go through my plan of salvation. You know, don't have this frame of mind. You don't have to have to go through this plan of salvation. This plan of salvation is there as a guide to help you know what are the important points to explain, but it's not the order that you have to explain it. So just do whatever's comfortable, do what is tailored for them, and speak to the person as an individual, not just as an audience. Um, so, you know, relate their responses. 
Like if somebody has an objection at the beginning where they say, well, they believe in a Catholic church or they believe in Mary or they're, they're Muslim, you know, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to bring that into what I'm talking to them about and relate that back. Like if somebody believes they have to work their way to heaven. When I get to the point where I'm saying, you know, it's only believe on Jesus Christ, I'll relate it back to them and say, hey, remember when you said to me what you thought had to, you had to do to go to salvation, uh, do to be saved, I'm going to relate it back to, to, to what they were saying to me. You know, it's a conversation, so find out, you know, find out what they believe. Ask them questions and say, you know, do you agree with this? Or, you know, how, how, you know get them to interact to make sure that they're uh, understanding you. And another great tip would be, you know, to use hypotheticals. You know, ask open-ended questions. So we use the hypothetical of the guy that believes on Jesus Christ but does such and such sin. Is he still going to heaven? Um, you know, asking open-ended questions. Don't just ask questions that can be a yes or a no answer because you might just get somebody that says yes, 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 and you think they're understanding, but they're not. They're just being polite or they're just trying to get you to go through what you want to explain. So ask them open-ended questions. For example, you know, instead of saying, do you understand what Jesus did for you, when, uh, did for you by dying on the cross, uh, saying, do you understand that? And they say yes. Maybe ask the question, so, so what did Jesus do for you? So that you could have a place in heaven. So what do you need to do in order to be saved? And get them to reiterate 